So my name is Dana Leslie, and I have the pleasure of introducing our first plenary speaker, Anthony Yanez. He is the meteorologist for NBC4's weekday newscast at 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. He holds the seals of approval with prominent weather organizations, including the American Meteorological Society, I knew I was going to screw that up, and the National Weather Association. One of the first projects he worked on with NBC Weather was a 30-minute special named El Nino Currents of Change. He won, an, he won an Emmy for that. He's also part of the team that won an Emmy for the coverage of the old fire in Calabasas. His passion is not only presenting the accurate weather, but also explaining why we're getting the weather we're getting. Please welcome Mr. Ant Yenez. While we're setting everything up, um, I just wanted to uh, introduce myself. My name is Anthony Yanez, as Dana was saying. I'm honored to be here today. Um, I think what's really unique about this is we're really merging uh, this morning climate and meteorology. And I'm going to uh, share with you uh, really the story of how things have changed in, honestly, just the last five years with meteorologists around the country now starting to tell a climate story. And prior to that, it just didn't happen. And there was a reason, and I, I, I did a story um, uh, last year about our disappearing marine layer. How the marine layer, going back to the 70s, isn't uh, as deep as it, as it was in the past. It doesn't last as long. And I was talking to the scientists who worked on this study, and they were sharing with me, we've heard a lot of you guys don't believe in climate change. And I said, well, climate change isn't a religion, so there's nothing to believe in. But I, I, I will say, yes, we were really slow to get to the party, and the reason is... As a meteorologist, we've lived throughout our entire careers of you got the forecast wrong. And we rely on weather models to guide us to what the outcome is going to be. And so automatically when we saw, thank you, when we saw model data that would show us what was going to happen in 10, to 30, into 50, to 100 years, automatically we were resistant to that by nature because we had a difficult time showing things that would happen five to seven to 10 days out, sometimes a few hours out when you're talking about tornadoes and convective thunderstorms. So we were really resistant to this. And so the story that I'm gonna share with you today is really what changed that? Um, and so it's a story of climate change on television. Do I need to turn this off? Um, or, okay, you good? Which one? This actually sounds better, I think, right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this. So, okay. <laughs> All right, climate change on television. I want to start um, this morning's talk all of, really with all of us getting on the same page. Um, uh, this is, these are all rhetorical questions, so I don't need anyone raising their hands, but I just want to kind of be on the same page of where we are. Uh, what are the five most important facts that every American should know about climate change? And you all being in the climate lobby, you should have this down. So this should be pretty easy, but I just want to make sure we're on the same page here. Uh, hint, each fact can be expressed in two words. Uh, it's real. It's us, human caused. Experts agree that human-caused climate change is happening. It's bad. Climate change is harming people. There's hope. There are things we can do about it. What proportion of Americans currently understand it's real? Now what I'm asking you is not what you believe in this room. I want you to now guess, assume, or predict what are your fellow, Amer fellow Americans thinking? You just saw the slide about Democrats were way up high. Republicans were way down low. So if we interview both Republicans and Democrats, who's, what's the percentage that's real? 10, 20, 70, or 90 percent? 70 percent. Oh my gosh, we've got a brilliant room here. Uh, not happening. It's pretty consistent since 2009, 10, 12 percent. You see a, t a few spikes here, 20 to 23 percent, but for the last 10 years it's been pretty consistent. What proportion of Americans currently understand it's us? 20, 40, 60, or 80 percent? Oh, we got a lot of different answers there. Six in 10 Americans think global warming is mostly human caused. What's also interesting about this, think global warming is caused by natural changes in the environment. 
That's a pretty consistent 30%. Three in 10 people think, you know what? Hey, it's happening, but it's the sun. It's cycles. What proportion of Americans currently understand? Experts agree. 15, 35, 55, or 75%. 55% of Americans understand that most scientists agree. If you're on the internet at all, this is a big thing that is pushed hard against. No, 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 these experts don't agree. These scientists don't agree. No, no, no. And that marketing machine really gets that number to 55%. Uh, most scientists think global warming is not happening. Well, the good thing is that they pretty much see that that's a pretty low number. Um, there's a lot of disagreement among scientists. One in four Americans think there's disagreement. What proportion of Americans currently understand it's bad? And I'll tell you, I've seen websites that say, hey, this is good, CO2, we got great plants now. <laughs> 25, 45, 65, and 85%. 45% of Americans think uh, people in the US are being harmed right now by global warming. I, I want to pause here. Um, in January, I just got back from the American Meteorological Society's uh, conference. Did anyone in this room go to that? No. OK. It's a meteorology meeting, and so I, I, I get that. But the big push there is there's a million talks on climate change. I got these talks from um, the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication and George Mason University Center for Climate Change Communication. Uh, they gave a talk about this, and I, when I saw that, I'm like, oh, I have this talk. Um, can I get your slides? Um, this, this study was done just a couple months ago, so this is pretty accurate as far as what people think right now, in November uh, 2019. I wanted to make sure I mentioned that, that this isn't a study I did. This is what they did. Uh, so 45% of Americans think people are being harmed. Um, what's the trend here? It's going up. I'm going to talk about why in a little bit, but um, 2010, it was the lowest 25, 24%, 21 percentage point hike since 2010 think it's harming people right now. OK, what proportion of Americans currently understand there's hope? 20, 40, 60, or 80 percent? Now, that's a completely different question. 42 percent. Wow, you got a lot of you in the front got that right. 42 percent of Americans feel hopeful about global warming. Um, that's this line right there, 9 and, 13, 9 and 33. But look at helpless. 53%. Now, I'll admit, just because of where I work and when I do stories and the pushback we get on social media, they, I'm, I'm in that field because I really see the, or feel the polarization. Sometimes you all work and work and work, but on TV, you, you really feel that. There are people around the country who've done uh, climate change stories and will get major trolls on the internet and really big pushback. And it really makes you feel hopeless when you realize there's a percentage of the country that's really against that message you're sharing, when maybe all you did was share the most recent science. Um, but there is hope. Over the past five years, there's been a large increase, about 15 points, in the, in the portion of Americans who understand all of these facts, with the exception of there's hope. And I think a lot of the message today is, I think a, a lot of people are really coming around and agreeing with you. We were just talking about the Republicans coming around. But I think there's almost this feeling of, well, hey, we look at the projections. Even if we fixed everything perfect right now, we still have these years it's going to be like this. So I think there's a hopelessness out there. But there is hope. And maybe that's the next step with the message. Um, I thought this was fascinating. Again, this is from the same group. Uh, they, again, this is a nationwide study. And what they did was they looked at, uh, they, they interviewed all these different Americans. And what they found uh, was this. And so they put Americans into these groups. So you have the alarmed. So these are the highest belief in global warming. They're the most concerned. They're the most motivated. I think pretty much everybody in this room is there, right? Um, if you're not, I would guess you're probably concerned. Right? I mean, I think at, in, if you're in this room, I think at the worst, you're concerned. I mean, it's worse is saying, like, that's, those are your two things. But they're interviewing everybody, people who aren't in this meeting. And they found 16% are cautious. 7% are disengaged. 
But the lowest belief in global warming, the least concerned and the least motivated, 20%, those are the doubtful and the dismissive people. And they basically put the, when they did the study, they, they realized this is who our audience is. This is who we're speaking to. This is who we're sharing our message with. The alarmed, concerned, cautious, disengaged, doubtful, and dismissive. And, and, and on TV, honestly, when we do a story, we hear most from these people, and we hear most from these people. They're mean, they're really supportive. <laughs> but I mean, just, just kind of how it is. Um, extreme weather, though, is changing people's views. And this is where I come in. 48% of Americans say the science on climate change is more convincing than five years ago with extreme weather driving their views. We, how long has this message been around? How long have we said that, hey, CO2 is warming the atmosphere? There are things that happens when the atmosphere is warmed. And the IPCC put out these reports, and they gave predictions. And they said these things are going to happen. And a lot of people dismiss that, because I'll believe it when I see it. Or this is 100 years from now. I'm going to live another 30 years. Why do I care about 100 years? Because I don't care about my grandchildren, like some of you do, right? I mean, that's, what they're, that's how they're looking. But now, all of a sudden, what's happening is it's affecting them today. It's affecting their children today. So now, all of a sudden, this message that we've all been sharing for a while, right? I bet you guys have been at this for a while. It is now being held on to. This is fascinating to me. Climate change on television. Uh, Climate Matters is a group that I'm going to talk about a lot in this talk. But they did, they have a, a little, I don't know how it works, but on TV, if the word climate change is used on television, global warming, they have certain parameters. When it's used on television, they get a ding, basically. And they can look at, oh, where was this story told? What was told? So these are stories, climate change stories. So, so this isn't just like a, uh, so-and-so talked about climate change at, at, at New Washington, D.C. on the Capitol. That's not a story. That's just like a, a mention. But actual climate change stories that talk about the science. In 2014, 69 stories nationwide. National media, local media, teeny tiny markets like Roswell, New Mexico, big markets like New York, 60 Minutes, 69 climate stories. 492 in 2015, 460 2016, 879 2017, 1772 2018, 2019, 3,503 stories on climate change presenting the science of climate change. Pretty fascinating what's happening. So what is happening? Why is this happening? Um, there's 800 TV, television meteorologists now who have spoken about climate change on television and presented it as a story. Again, whether it's the science, whether it's adaptation, whether it's a solution, but these are stories. And I'm going to share a couple of these with you in a minute. Um, most are on the East Coast. Why? Well, a couple of reasons. There's a lot more population out there. There's a lot more television stations. You look at New Mexico. I was mentioning Roswell. There's one TV station in New Mexico, and that's in Albuquerque. So don't think that only one person's talking about it in Albuquerque, New Mexico, if there's only one TV station, so there can only be one. Uh, the other one you see south is El Paso, Texas. Uh, you're seeing the same thing in Nevada and Utah. There's only one station in these markets. And so it, it's basically filled out almost everywhere in the country, east coast, west coast, south, north. It's, it's pretty much everywhere that meteorologists, 800, are talking about climate change. I mentioned climate matters. We are meteorologists. When I went to school, the most I learned about climate was the basic foundation of here's what happens with cycles, here's how the climate works. And I can remember it in one line. Uh, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. And, and honestly, that's kind of how I remember that one class on climate change. Or climate, excuse me, not even climate change. This is way back, I'm really old, so it was way back in the day. Now, these meteorologists, because they're meteorologists, and that's kind of the only class they had as, cli as climate, um, we're not experts in this. But Climate Matters has come along to really help us understand the science of climate change, because it is different. And one of the big things, as I was mentioning at the beginning, was we were really resistant on the models. The models are completely different. Models that look at things from 50 to 100 years from now are completely different or models that look at something an hour 
three hours, three days, five days, 10 days from now. They are completely different. Um, and so what they did, and one of the things I loved, and I, 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 I learned so much from, is they had a, a workshop. Um, they flew us out to uh, DC. We went out to NASA Goddard. And we had a, a two-day conference with these climate experts answering all our questions. We're sitting down. We're getting to ask these questions of like, hey, how do you know what the weather's going to do in 30 years when I don't know what it's going to do in 10 days? And they're able to answer those questions. So that was really fascinating. Um, but they have all of these different resources for us to get information. And this is just one of them. This is, I, I just wanted to put together, we get weekly emails from them. And their slides, we can create them on our own um, and change a little bit to make it look more like our look on television. Or we can take it as is. But let me walk through a couple things. First of all, they give you the data. So they do all the work for you. They give you the data of hotter years, more fires from 1980 to 2017, number of large fires across Western states. I mean, that's great information. And it's just given to us. And so we're able to talk. So when there's a fire, we're able to show what the winds are, what the humidity is, um, what's going to happen with the temperatures, and what's going to happen with this fire for the next several hours, the next several days. But we're also able to kind of add now a climate story to say, hey, did you know, though, that since 1980, as temperatures have warmed in the West, <laughs> fires have got, there's been more fires. Um, of course, the effects now, as I was mentioning, wildfire pollution harms health. We're able to talk about that. There's also an honesty. Um, unhealthy ozone days, I think this is really fascinating. The 2000 to 2014 annual average in Los Angeles, it's pretty consistent. It hasn't gone up yet. The forecast is it's supposed to go up, but you are able to say, hey, you know what? Here's the honest answer. It hasn't yet, but the projection is it's going to. Uh, but you're able to kind of show those trends. But some trends go up, some trends are level, some go down. So you're, you have all these different uh, things to talk about. Uh, the power of trees, I just I thought this was unique. Uh, 1.9 million tons CO2 equivalent removed. Again, this is just unique information to show on television. Uh, 1,050 million gallons of storm runoff avoided. Would Houston, Texas, looking back, have loved to maybe not build, it, build so many homes on these areas that used to take the flood water and now they go into neighborhoods? 42 million um, pounds, it was hard to see it, but looking at that. 42 million pounds of air pollution absorbed, all because of trees. We have a great, the tree people group here in Los Angeles that goes in. Yes, they go out and they plant these trees. And you're able to maybe, if you do a story on the tree people, you can add this slide with it. So this is really unique information that's a little different than here's your temperature, here's your forecast, here's when it's going to rain. You're now starting to tell a climate story. Um, who watches? Channel 4. A few of you? OK. Every day, now this, every day we do a story, uh, a franchise story on what? This is, I mean, it's really hard. I'll just give you the answer. Every day we do a story on, called Streets of Shame. So we talk about the homelessness crisis uh, in Los Angeles, in Southern California. Every day. In Washington, DC, you know what they do every day? They tell a climate story. Climate Central, who I was just talking about, they went in, they met with their production people, they met with their producers, they met with anchors, they met with reporters, they met with meteorologists, they met with salespeople. And they basically made a plan that every day they have a climate story. How amazing is that? Every day. I want, I want to toot NBC's horn. So for all, for 90% of you that didn't raise your hand for watching NBC, um, I want to say, NBC has really made it an initiative that we tell these climate stories. Uh, these are all of the different, uh, few of the, I didn't all of them, here are a few of the different stations around the country, Christie's in Philadelphia, and we're all presenting these climate change stories on television. Every NBC station has been tasked to do these stories, do more of them, get to the science. That's pretty incredible. That's coming from the top, saying we want you to do this. Isn't that awesome? I, I, I love this story. Uh, for those of you who watch CBS in the morning, Jeff Bernadelli has a fascinating story. Him and his wife were in Florida. And they're from New York, and they wanted to go to, back to New York. He didn't have a job. He had some leads, but he didn't have a job. But he went to New York and basically bugged CBS 
and said, you do not have a climatologist, you do not have anyone telling a climate story when all of these things are happening around the world. I can do that. And he bugged him, they said no, he bugged, he bugged, he bugged, and you know why they let him in? Because they couldn't not let him in. There's too many stories around the world that are happening right now. He's getting, his, he's finishing up his doctorate right now, um, so he can say, hey, when people come against him, say, hey, how do you know? He's like, well, I'm a doctor in this, so I know. So, I mean, that's, that's amazing vision that Jeff, ha that Jeff had. And so he'll do these, he was talking about the Australia fires. He was talking about, um, this is something, uh, a picture when he was talking about what's happening here in California. But nationally, he's on, whenever there's something in the morning going on, he's on talking about how climate is affecting whatever that situation is. Pretty awesome there. And he created that. That was just his idea um, to go back to school and do that. I mean, how many people do that? Quit, quit their job in Florida go to New York without a job, to go to school in New York, and then that's what it turned into. Pretty awesome. Global temperatures from 1850 to 2018. So how many, how many meteorologists are doing this? You sh I was showing you the 800. Um, Mets Unite on climate change. They even had a day where they have this, and people have made mugs, made ties, uh, made little buttons, little pendants. Um, but these are all the meteorologists around the country who are saying we're united. Um, with what the science is, is sharing. Pretty incredible. Um, I, I think this is kind of interesting. It's all, this is everything I've shared so much is, is right now is on, on climate change, weather power, wind and solar forecasts. So what I've been shared so far is kind of really the science of what's happening, but there's also other steps and other directions you can go. And I think this is fascinating. Um, there's a group that Climate Central um, partnered with to talk about how important is wind power, wind energy? How important is solar power? And how is that helping what's going on here in the United States? Let me share this video. Let me see if you can actually hear the audio here. Yeah. And there's a new tool that we're going to use to quantify how much electricity we're getting coming from solar and from wind. We are really in a good spot to get more energy out of the wind. And you can see the effect here. Uh, for today, you can see here the equivalent car miles, the equivalent trees planted, and the equivalent smartphones charged. And I think this is a really <laughs> cool thing to look at. Today and tomorrow, it is a great time to use solar power your home. Look at our solar power index coming in from Climate Central today and tomorrow at a perfect... How few people have solar in D.C. So Climate Central came out with, with this, and they're partnering with this group, and they're saying, how would you guys like to share these? slides these images on television specific to your market. Again, the work is done for you. Um, and so when they, they gave this to me, I was like, okay, I want to do more than that because it's a lot of numbers. And I do not do well with a lot of numbers. I get, if, it, if I get lost on it, I know people watching me on TV are like, I'm getting lost on it too. So what I did was this story. Oops. Um, this is three minutes, so you can drink your water. Um, <laughs> But I'm going to share how I took this information and what I did with it here in L.A. This summer, they'll start breathing in CO2. So this is the time of year when CO2 levels peak. But this time, we're taking it to a whole new level. It's not just the highest we've seen in recent years, as this graphic shows. It's the highest we've seen in over 2 million years. Of course, we've seen natural variations throughout Earth's history. But natural variations. You can see we are now headed off the charts. So what can we do? ABC 15 meteorologist John Patrick shows us ASU leading the way in technology design to pull out what we're pumping into our atmosphere. How amazing is that? Yeah. CO2, CO2 in a weather forecast. You see how CO2 is in, in history and where it is now? Pretty amazing. And again, this is all coming from Weather Central. They're giving us this stuff and then they're taking it and they're turning it into a story, a local story.
And that's that's in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Amber Sullins is a really good friend of mine, and she's like one of the big leaders uh, who's done this for a long, long time. Um, but other, again, that's Arizona. I've showed you DC, us. Um, but other markets are, are doing social uh, media video shares, the local data, branded regular series. It's pretty incredible what's going on around the country. Um, it's on the web, too. Houston, Texas here. And I'll tell you a, a story about Houston. When I worked there, um, there was a guy who would not talk about climate change on television. He said, it turns off too many people and I don't want to lose my audience. I don't want to have the numbers go down. I don't want to be fired because I'm telling these stories. So he didn't do it. And he said it. He would be pushed against. So everyone's doing these stories. And he was really against doing these stories. Now he doesn't work at that station anymore uh, for reasons not climate related. But he was so worried about losing his job, he didn't do climate change stories. And it didn't matter. He's not working there anymore. This is from Frank Billingsley, my old boss uh, at KPRC and the NBC affiliate in Houston, Texas. And it's just really simple, but these get huge web numbers. Whenever he does kind of these blog posts, they get um, a ton of clicks. What happened to winter? Only two days have dropped to freezing since November. Notice the slides, here they are. Warming winters for Houston, shorter cold snaps, so when it is cold, it doesn't last as long. Again, this is all from Climate Central, and he's taking this, putting it on TV, but it's also lasting for more than just that two minutes on TV. It's now on the web and it's there as long as that page works. And he's showing different things. But he's really got a lot of traction on this. Again, Houston, Texas, where I think a lot of people would assume would be not really all that open. Oh, they're open after Hurricane Harvey. They're open. And so what's the science? And he's sharing the science. So what the message really has to be about, on television especially, it has to be about people. And I think, for those of you in this room, I'm sure you've probably heard this already, when you talk about polar bears, yes, I, I love polar bears. We all love polar bears. But when you talk and tell stories, this is affecting the polar bears, people are really easy to say, OK, well, that's sad, and move on. But when you talk about how air quality, how flooding, how all of these issues are affecting our kids today, suddenly people want to take action. Because the story has to be about people. Even though I love polar bears, I do. I don't want, I don't want to say it. I don't want to get away from that. But it, it's really about us now. OK, let's see if this works. Um, OK, it looks like, yeah, it's not clicking. But this, I again, I don't know if we can get to I'm, I don't. In fact, I don't think we can if it's not working. But this would have been really fascinating. This guy did a story where he went to Guatemala to coffee producers and how climate change is affecting these coffee crops and how it's actually affecting immigration because they're losing the crops and so what are they doing? They're going to the only hope they have, which is maybe I can make it to the United States because my life here is pretty much over. And he did a story on climate change and immigration. Uh, climate change from Palm Springs. Imagine, if you will, what is going on in the Coachella Valley. And he, did, he took this national idea, and then he focused it on what's happening in Palm Springs. Um, and this is what it's about. Our atmosphere is what differentiates us from other planets. This was taken from a, uh, by an um, astronaut. And when he saw this, that the atmosphere is so thin and so fragile, he realized this is pretty, pretty amazing and, and pretty incredible how we live. And it's all because of this little slim, sl thin slice of our atmosphere. And it just it changed him. It's, it's just this is what it's all about. There's not a lot to it. It's pretty thin. It's pretty fragile. And we're affecting it. Attribution science. I have to explain this a little bit because this is, to me, it's kind of difficult to understand just to start with. But understanding the effect of climate change on an event type. Confidence in capabilities for attribution of specific events to anthropogenic climate change. Detection, less knowledge, more knowledge. 
understanding causes, less knowledge, more knowledge. One of the amazing things that's going on right now is when an event happens, how much can we attribute that event to climate change? And this is a really big, like, cutting edge science right now to where we're able to talk about this on TV. But I want to show you something that's pretty amazing. Extreme cold, extreme heat, precipitation, flooding, heat waves, cold waves. We're really confident in climate change is having a big effect on that, and you can see it. You can attribute that. You can see the correlation. But look at what's not there. What's on the low end? Wildfires. Why? Well, because there's more than just it being hot and how that heat makes more evaporation and how, how that more evaporation um, brings about more dead fuel and how that more dead fuel uh, brings about more heat and that vicious cycle is going on. There's also, since we've moved to the West, we've basically, every time there's a fire, we put it out like that. So the, all, there's all this fuel that's just saved up there. So when you take climate change, but you also have what we've done with the fuels. We're also building houses in places we never built houses before. So when there is a fire that's always been there, what I'm amazed, and I love these talks, when they show the history of fires in certain areas, and there's a fire in this one spot every 40 to 60 years, and how 40 to 60 years ago there was this fire, and nobody lived there, and now 40 to 60 years later, it's an entire community that just burnt down because they built here. So that's why that's on the lower end. Um, thunderstorms, tornadoes, that's really tough to see, but also look at this. Tropical cyclones, hurricanes. The general thing, and this has been around for a long time, is that with climate change, because there's more water vapor, the ocean's warmer, hurricanes should be increase in strength. But, but there should be less of them. So the ones that form should be stronger, but there shouldn't be as many. But they're still working on, I mean, these are things that are being worked on right now. But it's pretty incredible, the things we don't know, what we do know. Winds, tornadoes, I mean, what we know, what don't know, what we know. Here's the way I look at it, because I'm, I'm a, a pretty simple guy. Attribution science. Climate change doesn't cause one extreme event to occur, but it does make extreme events more likely. In Little League, this kid is a home run hitter. For me, Greg Mix, that was Greg Mix. Whenever Greg Mix, and this is a little, I remember this, I was a kid, eight years old. Whenever he came up to bat, Everybody at Roadrunner Little League went to watch him bat because he would hit home runs. It was pretty awesome. That's Greg Mix. In Little League, this kid's a home run hitter. In high school, guess what Greg Mix did? He hit more home runs. He was really awesome. In college, he's a home run hitter. So this kid's always been a home run hitter. Let's change the story now. Not Greg Mix, that's just somebody else. In the pros, he takes human gro growth hormone. He's now setting records for home runs. Which home run? came from HGX, HG, HGH. He's always been a home run hitter. Now he's setting records. What's happened? It's made it more likely that he hits home runs. Now he's setting records. So you can't say this home run is because of climate change, but you can say climate change sure did make all those home runs more likely. I love this, and I got this from the AMS talk just last month. This is from Dr. Mark, Dr. Marshall Shepard, who knows know him. This is how he explains attribution science. This kind of detailed, and because I don't bake, this is a little confusing to me, but <laughs> here it is. The ingredients are factors that align to cause an event. So with weather, you have low pressure, you have water vapor, you have, war you have all these things, right? So those are the ingredients, the factors that align to cause an event. But you also have your baking surface and oven temperature. Those are the conditions in which the event occur. So you see what I'm doing? If you just think about how this affects the weather and climate. If you're going to mess with ingredients, like the baking surface, oven temperature, you still get a cookie, but it'll look different, taste different, and feel different. Do you see what climate change is doing to our weather? We're tinkering with all of these things, we as people. And what we're doing with putting CO2 in the atmosphere and now all of a sudden what's happening is we're getting different kinds of cookies. We're getting different kinds of weather events. The future, good climate science is getting out. Thanks to Climate Central for us, it's really helped. 
you guys, that's getting out. But you know what? Bad climate science is getting out too. For me, I have to be on Twitter and I read these things and I just, this is why I feel helpless because I'm like, oh my gosh, why are they saying that? It's not accurate. The message has to focus on adaptations and solutions. You're here. You're all the solutions, right? The, I, I love that talk. Here's what we're doing. We're working together and we're coming up with these solutions. And until then, how do we adapt? And the story is on adapting. The message of fear and put downs doesn't work. Uh, and you saw that line. What was the line with the Republicans down here? When you tell a Republican that they're dumb, that they're a denier and anything, what do they do? They back up in their corner and they put their fists up and they fight harder. It doesn't work. But when you bring them along with you, what were we just sharing? How amazing was that, that when we can work together, we can find solutions. The first question that we had was, how can we as CCL volunteers engage with TV meteorologists to ask them to connect extreme weather to climate? Well, you see, we're, we're doing it, but you know what? I mean, follow us. My first slide was how to follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Follow us and ask us questions. I'll tell you what, we're not as busy as you think. <laughs> Reach out and say, hey, listen, I just went to this class and I learned this. And for me, I would be like, that's a great story. Let's do it. That's how easy it is. And whether you're from other places, I think, is everybody from here, Southern California? No, not everybody. Reach out to your local meteorologists. They want good stories. They do. You're going to find a couple, like the person I was mentioning who says, I'm not going to talk about that on the air. But you know what? Most people, I showed you those 800 meteorologists, they're going to want to do this. Yes. Next question. What resources on connecting climate and weather communication can you recommend, and how can we support them? Climate Central. I sent you that slide. Um, OK, it doesn't look like it's going to work. Uh, OK, it's fine. Um, if, I'll just say this. If you want to see those two stories that I did, Anthony Yanez Weather on YouTube. Anthony Yanez Weather. And the two stories I want you to look at is the, uh, the solar story and how LA is putting in solar panels in homes uh, for people who can't afford it. That's my story and how I took those graphics. And the other story is on in climate change and fires and really how complicated the subject is. Um, those are the two, uh, Anthony Yana's weather. Uh, Climate Central, I, I had that slide up there. Uh, support them, they, they have a lot of board members here actually in Southern California, um, but they're great. They, they are just, they're really great. Well, I, I think the big thing, the cutting edge thing right now is the attribution science. Could you please repeat the question? Okay. Um, like, what's the big, th what's a big thing that's happening right now? What's something that stands out against the clutter of all these? Yeah. Like what's happening with, um, what's standing out in climate change right now? I think the big thing that's, that's standing out is how quickly we're able to talk about a climate change event after a weather event happens. I, I think when, when you saw Australia, with all the fires in Australia, I saw people like Jeff Bernadelli on CBS talk about how the IPCC uh, predicted this would happen 15 years ago, almost to the date that in, 20, in 2020, this is what's going to happen in Australia because the jet stream is going to change. There's going to be rain, but it's going to move it to the west of Australia, and Australia is going to have this dry, dry period. And if there's a spark, and it could be from arson. I mean, that's what I saw on the right. All the people on the right saying these fires are from arson. It's like, yeah, well, if you start a fire right now outside, nothing's going to happen because it's not the season. If you start it in the summer, of course, you're going to have everything go up. So it didn't matter how it started. What happened was once you got those, those things took off. So the big thing is I think attribution science is, is cutting edge right now. Okay. Yep, here it is. Perfect. Oh, you did it. Okay, so here is, let's see how much time I have. I got 10 minutes. Here is, uh, this is the wildfire story, and I'll just show a couple of minutes of it largest and most destructive in California history. Many point to climate change as part of the problem, but are there other explanations as well? Meteorologist Anthony Anas is here now with a closer look for us. Anthony. Carolyn, it's a topic that can't be avoided. It is climate change to blame for how large and destructive our California wildfires are. The scientists who work daily with fires say the answer isn't a simple one. 
You can't avoid the images and scale. The two most destructive and two largest fires in California history have occurred in the past two years. November's campfire destroyed nearly 19,000 structures, and the Mendocino Complex and Thomas fires burned 750 million acres combined. Is this climate change? The things that we care about in fire are getting more severe during the fire season. So things like early and mid, things like the number of days without rain, temperature, wind speed, all those things are, are getting more severe during the fire season in the western United States. The simple answer is yes. A warmer climate leads to more evaporation. That leads to more drought, leading to more dead fuel, which leads to hotter temperatures. A vicious cycle. But when it comes to fires in California, these scientists say climate change, while a culprit, may not be the main villain. We've just seen big changes in vegetation out there, a lot more fuel thrown up because of how we manage our, our forests and our brushlands. And then we have a ton more homes spread out across the landscape. Mark Finney is known as the fire historian at the U.S. Forest Service Fire Sciences Lab in Missoula, Montana. He says how we manage our forests isn't a new problem. The early settlers practiced fire suppression right after they built their homes. <coughs> and Finney says this practice of not letting fires do what they've always done has made California fires, in certain cases, unstoppable. So in essence, what our modern management is doing is saving the fuel by removing all the fire under mild and moderate conditions, saving the fuel for the worst case when we can't do anything else about it. To Finney, we've taken an ecosystem that was sustained by fire and turned it into one that is destroyed by it. All right, our next question is, what can we do to influence TV weather people who are not as with it as you? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> There's something I want to say, but I, I don't want to say, say it. I think we all, we all know what we know. I, I've had a lot of training, but I was open to this. And I'll be honest, Climate Central really came along and helped me. I mean, I was not an expert on climate. I, I, I'm not an expert on climate. But when I'm around people like yourselves who are experts, I learn. There are people in any profession that go to work, do their thing, go home. There are people who go to work, do their thing, and always want to challenge themselves. I, I think you can always ask. I think if you have a favorite meteorologist, you have a favorite reporter, reach out to that favorite person and say, I think this is a great story. And if there's somebody that works hard, they'll look at it. And if it's something they can do, they'll do it. Um, for me, the way I look at things is, um, I, I got confused when I looked up there. For me, when I look at things, I, I often, the hardest part of my job is the idea. It's not how to do it, it's the idea. And one story that I loved, I was mentioning the, uh, the disappearing marine layer. I found that as a science article. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a great story. But I didn't think of that on my own. I, found, I was reading science articles. And I thought it'd be a great story. Um, so if you have a great idea, challenge us. Anyone, your favorite, challenge us. OK, another question. How are news stations like yours fighting fake news on climate change? Here's the great thing about a news station. All of our stories are vetted like crazy. They, they're checked. I mean, any story that's on TV, yes, you guys hear about the mistakes that media make, but they're pretty small. Most things are really checked out. Um, Fake news actually doesn't get on TV. You know where fake news comes from? Fake news comes from, uh, well, it comes from Twitter, honestly. I see these things that are just said, and then it spreads like wildfire. And also, you're mentioning what you just said. When you have panels that just talk, that's not news. If I took five of you up here and we talked about climate change, and somebody just made stuff up, and it was broadcast around the world, it's going to be labeled as fake news. This person's talking fake news. It's not news, right? It's a panel. When you watch those panels, those panels say crazy things, right? I'll say CNN and Fox. I mean, I know you, you said Fox over there. I say both, but that's not news. Those are talking panels, and they'll bring somebody up. Uh, Chuck Todd got uh, hammered on this, where they had somebody on that was just making up, I mean, not making up statistics, but the statistics weren't supported. 
And he, he didn't challenge it because he didn't know. And then everyone was like, hey, that's not right. And that, but that wasn't news. That was a panel that they're talking about an issue. I think when you see stories, stories are a lot better because they're vetted. Pa beware of panels, um, or honestly, because you never know what someone's going to say. OK, we have five minutes left. I'm going to share a couple of minutes of this. And I, I just I like the story of how it came about. Let me see if I can get this full screen here. Um, what kind of feedback has NBC gotten on climate stories it's already run? I don't think a lot, honestly. I've, it doesn't get back to, when I do a story, I don't hear a lot. Well, management, I mean, they're happy that I filled three minutes of their show, <laughs> but I don't, no one's, patting, no one's patting me on the back, and also, I don't get a lot of, I mean, being in Southern California, you don't get a tremendous amount of pushback. Um, I think in other parts of the country, I would, I'll tell you, getting out of myself, I, when I was at doing this and putting together all these stories from around the country, um, what people have found is that the pushback is really small. When you present the science, the pushback is small. If you present the politics and you know, you're a bad person for doing this, the, the pushback is going to be bigger, but they don't, we don't do that. It, we present the science. And when we present the science, viewers on both sides of the aisle are very respectful and receptive to that. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. Um, for me, I, I, don't, I don't hear anything. Okay. Southern California averages 284 days of sunshine a year. But right now, we're in the cloudy and rainy season. So this is a good time to show the effects of solar panels powering your home. If you've ever considered the move to solar power, you know you have to weigh the cost of installation to the expected savings over time. Again, this is just an idea from those slides. Install solar panels to communities most in need. It's a sunny morning in Linwood, and this Grid Alternatives crew is doing an install. But these workers aren't your typical crew. Nyla Kusar and Spencer Jefferson are part of an on-the-job training program that provides vital skills in the solar industry. It's always good to come to a job with like some kind of like knowing. So I think me having the skills to install and everything. So job creation. And I would know everything to do really. So I wouldn't have to have any extra training. Jefferson's goal is to take what he's learning here and start his own real estate or construction company. This job training is a key component of the disadvantaged community solar home program. It's a new state initiative that installs solar panels for income qualified homeowners and communities that are disproportionately impacted by poor air quality. It helps the environment by installing clean energy in neighborhoods that under normal circumstances couldn't afford it. It's good to know that, you know, we're making an impact out here. So it all starts with um, us just identifying someone who's in need, you know, who could use the additional uh, you know, funds for basic needs. When this installation is complete, the homeowner will save about 60% a month on their utility bill, which translates to $7,000 in 20 years. Again, how does it affect us? Many of things that made us decide to actually apply for the program, um, because we know we're going to be saving money on energy. Laura Marquez owns this home, and she's one of 200 homeowners who qualify for a solar power installation this year. We want to use something for our children, our hearts, you know, so we want to use some kind of re re renewable energy and make sure that, you know, our grandkids have a, have a good place to live. Solar is great for our customers and the environment. Solar is powered by the sun, so it doesn't really harmful pollutants into the air, which is great for everyone. I mean, for FDE, it helps us produce more uh, clean energy and provides more clean energy to the grid. This week is a great example of solar power. And now the slide comes in. Entering the forecast. First, here's the percentage of homes getting electricity from the sun's analog. And then you can look at that. But again, with the last minute I have, she, the owner, did it because she saved money. And she did it for the earth. She had two reasons there. Those were those open-ended questions I asked her. So why'd you do this? Well, save money. And the second one was because I, I want to do something positive for my kids. And then these are the numbers. And it's, it's interesting. This is cloudy, cloudy days. You're still, the point of the story when I did it was all, on this day when the forecast is, you're still saving money on a cloudy day. Pretty awesome. I, I, my time is done. So thank you so much uh, for having me. So 
Anthony, we're ready to work with you. Um, I don't know what went with Mike, but Oops. we're ready, ready and willing to work with you on a story, right? Yeah. We're ready to work with you on a story. Um, and that's one of the issues is that we, um, we're getting the message out there. You see 7 in 10 believe global warming is occurring, but still 50% think it's not harming us. So climate education is so important, and we need the media to cover it. But the link is, Anthony, my question would have been, is what do we do after that? Where do these people go to connect to groups, to be part of this? You know, this is what CCL is for. It took me a while to find CCL. Thank you.